So everybody, what's up everybody? John Freeman, West Bowling. We've got Laurie Lindsay with us. Uh, thanks for joining us. I know the last time I was talking into a microphone and talking about Nashville SC, it was at Providence Park in Portland, Oregon. And things have certainly changed as we all know. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I am part of our radio crew here on ESPN 94.9 Game 2. I'll be joined by West Bowling once the games do resume. And I have had the privilege of broadcasting alongside Laurie Lindsay, who joined us on our first two radio broadcasts and has just been announced as a member of the Nashville SC TV crew. So first of all, guys, Wes, how you doing, partner? It's been a while since I've seen you. I'm looking forward to working with you this season, whenever that may be. Been a while since a broadcast, been a while since a haircut, been a while for a lot of things for all of us. You know what, though? It's all right. Drinking out of the Nashville SC mug this morning uh, as we record this and uh, missing soccer a lot, but love so much of the creative stuff that's come up from the club around this and from the station to, to keep fans' appetites going. And Laurie, I know you're ready to, uh, to, to get back in the booth as well and have some actual soccer to call. Oh, goodness, am I ready? I mean, <laughs> it is. Um, yeah, as John had mentioned, um, we worked the first two games together, and that seems like ages ago at this point in time. But um, Exactly what you two said. I mean, it's been fun to to watch the kind of the 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 different uh, media stuff that's come out um, that Nashville's putting out, and hopefully, we'll be back to the game sooner than than later. So, Larry, I want to get to know a little bit more about you. So, I've had the privilege of traveling with you. Uh, you certainly eliminated some car rides with a lot of good stories in <laughs> and in, I want the fans to get to know you because they're going to be seeing a whole okay. lot of you. Um, Absolutely your playing background. I mean, you've mm -hmm. played at, at the highest levels. Uh, you, you played professional soccer, you played at the international level. Uh, you were a high level collegiate player at University of Virginia. Yes. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about um, your playing background, you know, when mm -hmm. you finally hung up the cleats and, and how do you transition to broadcast? Oh goodness. Yeah. I tried to give you like a minute. Of all. But basically, I grew up in Indiana, have a br older brother, Chris, who's a couple of years older. And um, essentially, I was, it was easier for my parents to like, kind of chuck both of us around rather than separately. So Chris kind of started dabbling in soccer, and that meant that I was going to be dabbling in soccer as well. And we came to love the game. And um, our dad wasn't like the type of dad that was like, hey, sit down and help you with your math homework. He was like the dad that was like, you're gonna go and do this fast footwork before you even do your homework, right? So it was kind of like the whole backwards, like, <laughs> like listen, this is how I can help you get out of Indiana or whatever, fulfill your dreams. And um, whether you like it or not, it's gonna be through soccer. So, <laughs> um, but that kind of it, um, really sparked my love. Um, and, and playing career essentially in Indiana. And it took lots of twists and turns. I quit playing for a while because of my wild dad, but um, then came back to it. And really that's kind of like, it's probably around eighth grade is like kind of the turning point for me. It was like, I started training and doing everything because I loved it. And that's a big turning point because that was kind of what my career was built off of. Like I, I worked hard, I trained um, on my own, played at UVA, as you mentioned, I played on all of our youth national teams growing up that got won me a scholarship to UVA and then from UVA um, played, ended up being like one of five players to play in all three of our professional leagues. And that, that kind of professional, playing in the professional leagues bridged my gap from college, professional, and then end up going to the senior national team and playing in the 2011 World Cup, 2012 Olympics. And then eventually, I guess it was like the very beginning of 2015 is where I, when I hung up my boots, I played um, two years in the NWSL and those two off seasons, I wasn't playing with the national team anymore. So I played over in Australia and Canberra and um, finished my career there. And it was, has been amazing. So here we are five years later. <laughs> yeah, and you're going to have so many insights to provide on the broadcast, you know, as a former player at all those different levels. Um, I, I think what's interesting, too, is your career has spanned so many different teams. I, I was mm -hmm. looking back at your history, and we think about this Nashville SC team being put together, you know, expansion draft, free agent signings. Walker Zimmerman found out he was traded while <laughs> The Bachelor. Yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> so I look back at your background, and, like, you were taking an allocation draft. 
you've been mm -hmm. traded before you've been signed what is that like as a player being moved maybe not not on your own choosing and then how do you adjust when you go to somewhere new um, as as a player who, who maybe didn't choose that path and is now you know expected to contribute for that team well anytime you sign up for know that, that that's, that's the case right you know that you there's potential to be jumping around there's potential to be moving without um your will or desire to move and there's a lot of uncertainty in that and it's really about i mean as cliche as it sounds about finding like the comfort and the uncomfortability right and so because at any time you can be moved and but it, i mean at the same time too um most of the time when you're playing contracts aren't guaranteed until and it's been different in a few of our late in a few of our leagues but your contracts wouldn't be guaranteed until a certain point in the con in in the season so at any time you could be replaced right and you you know that i mean obviously the hope is that that's the case like the hope is that you perform well and the team sees what you're contribution is but at the same time there is always in the back of your head that this is this is a cutthroat environment and this is why only a select um portion of the world plays professional sport because it's not for everybody it is it is very challenging and you're expected to perform so but i think that was one of the things i mean as, as funny as it seems looking back now is like the discipline that my dad instilled in us at an early age really contributed later on into my playing career and just how I approached every day and realizing to not take it for granted. And Hey, this is regardless if this is a fun little five V five tournament that we're playing at, at training that I take it seriously, right? Not where you're trying to hurt anybody. Right. But you're trying to win. You're trying to continuously prove that you can be the best. And that really, I think it was that like intrinsic quality and also that like learned environment that my dad set up that, um, really helped propel me and took me a long way in terms of the length of my career and um, being able to play on all different levels, right? Whether it's collegiately, whether it was professionally, I mean, cause those, all three of these professional leagues have looked so different. Uh -huh. And then, and then I don't think people understand the difference between professional and international and how, how much of a step that is, but the smallest little details separate players. So constantly having to find ways to, prove the value that you bring to a team it sounds like really it sounds like really wild too and also it's like so fun and so it's like <laughs> you're not like, you're not like going to practice like oh here i go again i'm just like, glad broadcasters can't get traded <laughs> like, I can't imagine, yes, like, uh, exactly you know brad baker calls us he's like john west we've traded you to fc cincinnati <laughs> <laughs> imagine imagine though if you could that'd be wild it kind of entertaining <laughs> yeah like, so, sabotage broadcast if you hate the team like <laughs> I, I have such a, an interest in in athletes and, and how they cope with so much of the anxiety that that is involved in this sport you know do you uh, get to settle in a destination um, mm -hmm. you know how long do you get to stay there uh, and even the micro transactions of are you in the game day roster uh, oh, so, absolutely, yeah I think that gets lost a lot when we think about these athletes, like, oh, it's such a, a wonderful world. They get to play a pro sport for a living. They are fighting and clawing just to make the game day 18 uh, mm -hmm. each time around. And Gary Smith tells us all the time, he says he likes that competition. It, it drives players in practice um, to know that somebody's you know right on your heels or that you can reach out and you can touch the starting 11. What is that like as a player? So the example I want from you is, you started a World Cup match. Mm -hmm. um, what is it like seeing your name? Is it the day before, a week before, two hours before on the whiteboard that you're going to be starting a match? And what is the buildup like as you await for the starting lineup from a coach and what could be a life-changing game? Uh, well, great question, because I do think that's, you know, a lot of times – we talk about the physical capabilities of athletes, but in obviously the mental aspect is, is, um, has been like dive deep into, um, by a lot of researchers and stuff and what that's like too, but it is, it's very emotional. It's emotionally taxing. So I always joke that it's like, you have to develop a short term uh, memory because it's like things change every single day. Right. So it's like, you can't hold on to anything. And like, if you're upset about how you played and that's carried into the next day, then that can, 
could lose your shot at like giving you the opportunity to start the next game, especially if like some major position goes down with an injury and you have to be ready, right? And so it's really about just like trying to get rid of it, moving on to the next. Um, but in terms of like the World Cup and what you're asking, yeah, I mean, essentially once you make the team and as soon as we get closer to the World Cup, at least this is how it was for us. And the, the team, the coaching staff has a kind of a general plan. Once we know who we're playing, the draw, then it's like, okay, this is how we play on, this is our starting, starting 11, but this is how we're going to maneuver through the tournament. And so I knew that I was most likely going to start against Colombia at the beginning of the tournament because that's kind of like the trajectory we're going to rest some players um, at this point in time and then kind of in this would be an ideal situation right but like talk about wild things that happen and that changes in the spur of a moment is against the Brazil game in the quarterfinals like I was supposed to play the whole second half so was Becky Sauerbrunn but then Rachel Bueller gets the red card we go down to 10 we end up um, falling behind two to one against and then Abby scores the you know one of the most brilliant goals in history of soccer in general and so we end up warming up for 90 plus minutes right instead of actually going into the game because it was like okay the whole game plan has changed and then um, prior to that we'd finished second in our group so it looked different on who we were going to play we ended up playing Brazil so all of this to say that like things change and you have an ideal plan and a lot of times that can go according um, to what you predict, but then also at like the spur of a moment. And it just plays into the fact that that's why it's like, I think Gary Smith talks about competition, right? And at any moment you have players that are ready because it was really like, there was an un deep understanding, especially, you know, I would argue in the 2015 and 2019 World Cup as well, but in 2011, there was a very like kind of set starting 11. That wasn't a secret, right? But everyone there was there to compete and fight for a spot, even if you knew that was like a slim chance and that wasn't going to just because the coach decided, hey, I don't, I, maybe I can't tell you why, but I like this group, right? And so that doesn't mean the players that were on the bench were less than or anything. So it, at that point in time, when you're at a tournament, you, it's not like you fall in line, but you are there for the team and you're there to help um, win. And that's always been a common understanding on our women's national team. It's like, we are here as a, like a greater group and whatever works for me individually is going to be, I'm going to put that out on the field to help, but like I take some backseat to the greater good. Mm -hmm. So Laura, that's a, that's that a theme. Well, yeah, that, that's a theme that, that you've touched on now in a couple of questions of that, that flexibility and that discipline amidst uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, can't imagine a more uncertain time for athletes <laughs> than right now uh, as yeah. we as we wonder when soccer is going to happen again and, and trust obviously the the league leaders to make that call and make the right call there but but as an athlete how would you handle this unexpected hiatus I know off season is set you know what it's going to be and you probably have a pretty set in stone training regimen for that but how do you how do you train how do you keep discipline intact amidst a time that it's uncertain as this one you know, it's funny because I've been thinking about that a lot recently, even like just the past week, because Megan Rapinoe and Sue Bird were talking about that, like, because there really is like kind of you're there's just nothing to like kind of grasp onto in terms of like what the start date looks like. And where is like, and it's, it's been known, they've talked about this, but Sue's fairly just very disciplined I would say, and almost like on an autopilot at this point in time in her, in her career. And little bit different personality, not as internally motivated <laughs> with the working out. Um, but credit to Sue for like pulling that more of that out of her. But that's what they talk about. I mean, it's been so tough to like get up every single day and okay, like, why am I doing a workout today? Like what exactly is this? Where's the motivation coming from? Why continue to have momentum each day? Um, so it's something that I think about. I mean, for me, I, I think it would be tough. I think some days would be tougher than others, but I much like Sue at one have was on autom autopilot for a long time. Like it just became such a part of my daily routine to work out that it's like, I didn't really even have to think about it. It was just like, okay, this is what I do. Um, this is what I enjoy doing. It feels like a step closer to like my goal of continuing to compete at the highest level. So I think if, if the, if I was in this situation, I would still kind of be finding my way with like in that regard. And then every day I'm also though, where I am now, I'm like, yes, I'm so happy <laughs> that I'm just walking for my exercise right now. <laughs> Not doing intervals right now. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I, I hear this so much when players are injured, 
uh, and coming back that, you know, sometimes they'll get sent down to like a small level loan or in England, they'll get sent to the U23s um, to get some games in before getting up to the top level. And you hear they need to get their match fitness back. Um, one, what does that mean? And I, I know relatively what it means, but as a player, how do you know when you're match fit? Um, and how do you know when you're not match fit? <laughs> yeah. And then um, second, the, the follow-up question to that is, what happens if no one is match fit? Like what type of soccer can we expect when this does come back? Because it's not like everybody's coming back from an injury. Mm -hmm. They're all coming back from the same level of, of isolation and not being able to train uh, and build up yeah. the season in a way they normally would. Well, I think the thing about match fitness is it's just that, right? Like you understand like when you've, nothing can replicate a game. So unless you're playing and you're playing small sided, but you're playing with like three minute intervals that kind of replicate kind of like the bouts of energy um, that you'll be putting out in a game or 11 aside, right, or actually playing regular games, nothing, if you're just doing intervals, nothing's going to match, match that. Um, at the same time, I'm fairly certain that most of these teams are giving their, their players some sort of conditioning and lifting programs at the best that they can, right, to be able to, what they have available to them and the access they have. So, um, but I mean, listen, these are professional athletes, and so it's not like, having some months off you're just come back and you've like don't know how to play soccer anymore I mean there is like um I don't even know if they call it muscle memory right but you understand the movements right you're gonna find athletes are gonna be sore it but it's gonna be like okay we're gonna have like a little bit of a period that's gonna look probably like preseason players are gonna be rusty playing together I'm sure there'll be like some of the timing will be off right some of but I mean for the most part like in terms of touch and stuff I mean the players are just it's been ingrained for so long in them that they will like give it a few days and they'll quickly get back into it um so I don't I think I think we're gonna see heightened soccer I think we're gonna see exciting soccer and I think that we'll see potentially you know, in, in some cases for some athletes, depending on what type of athlete they are, right, might be difficult for them to withstand a full 90 minute high intensity game. So we might see a little drop off around the 65th, 70th minute for some of the teams, some of the athletes, but I don't think it's, I think getting paid and you're in isolation, these athletes are still doing something um, physical to keep themselves at a high level that they can at least make up some ground fairly quickly once it starts back up. So they have had a lot of time to think about that preparation. We've had a lot of time as broadcasters to think about the team's first couple games and, and analyze what we saw from Nashville SC. I know the team's still looking for its first point, but a lot of promise shown out on the pitch in those first 180 minutes. What do you like about what you've seen from this Nashville SC team? And, and how do you expect it to get back into uh, a rhythm as games resume when, whenever they do? Well, what I've liked is um, the grit and the tenacity of the team. And you can tell that it's, you know, there's not, um, there's a lot of star players, but it's not like one, one player that's carrying this team. So it, they're really relying on all 18 or the 11 that are out there on the field. And you can really see that. I mean, John and I called both of those games and we, especially at Providence Park against Portland, I mean, better of the play for the majority of that game, despite the, I think it was in the first 14 minutes or so was the goal um, Portland scored. But other than that, really had Portland on their back heels, pushed them back and had the better of possession and, and some chances. But you can tell there's still like another level that the Nashville team can, uh, can get to. I mean, obviously it was only two games, right? So that's what we expect from an expansion team. But in terms of like goal scoring, because you do need some, sometimes that player that you can rely on that could score big goals um, despite how the team's playing. So I really like how the team's playing as a unit. Um, it seems like they're having a fun time and that playing two of the best teams historically in the league, Nashville is upset with those results. Um, two losses. And so it's not like, hey, we're an expansion team. There's enough experience. There's enough um, drive and ambition to, to do well in this inaugural season for them. And I think that's always what you're looking for um, from players. Yeah, you've been so on yeah, the sideline. Oh, sorry, John. Um, sure. You've been on the sideline for two awesome atmospheres. I mean, 59,000 people at Nissan Stadium, Portland, Providence Park, just notoriously uh, intense. 
as you've been on the sideline and, and performed your analyst role there, how do you watch the game? Uh, I know, you know, a casual fan's going to follow the ball. I know you with, with such depth of playing experience and, and you're used to seeing it from a field level as a player. Um, give us some insight into how you're watching the game, how you're picking up on different trends to know um, how things are unfolding. Yeah, you know, it's been it's been fun and so interesting to have a different vantage point because typically I'm in the booth, but now being on field side, there's so much more action going on. You're a little bit, you can be kind of isolated in the booth and just be able to focus on the game and have like a great view of like what's happening across the board. But from a field level vantage point, it's so different because you have the emotions that are coming from both benches you can feel and hear what's happening with the players on the field um, so but typically because i was a center midfield i am watching the center of the field a lot more often and how um, you know i view the game a lot from center mids and how they are being um, incorporated into the game or not depending on what each side looks like so um, watching Dax McCarty and his movements and how he's helping the team on both sides um, and just like the little intricacies of those players because a lot of times if you're just an average viewer and you're watching you won't notice a lot of movements that are happening and it doesn't have to be just in the midfield um, but across the um, across both teams and, and why a certain player is having an impact because of their movement, because they're occupying two defenders or two players from the, so I'm always kind of watching different matchups. Um, but again, my focus is typically in the middle field and then I'll expand from there depending on um, who, who's catching my eye and who I feel like is getting the ball a lot as well. I mean, cause that's obviously an indicator too. Um, but yeah, that's typically, and teaching and teaching and, yeah, it's fun. Well, Laurie, we certainly hope to have you in Nashville soon. Uh, I had the pleasure <laughs> of working with you. I, I know uh, what a professional uh, you are uh, in preparing for the broadcast and delivering them. And I think the television audience will, will find that out very quickly whenever yes. that first broadcast is. And hopefully later. So, hey, thanks so much for joining us. And we'll catch up next time you're back in Nashville. Yeah, thanks, John and Wes. I appreciate it. Great to see you all. That's Laurie Thanks. Lindsay and uh, for West Bowling, John Freeman saying we'll uh, we'll talk to you hopefully soon for a game on ESPN 94.9 <laughs> Game 2.